Gracias. I hope you enjoyed that film, everyone. Over the next few minutes, we're going to learn and discuss the issues raised with a Q&A. As the GCC, we're committed to tackling tough, hard issues as a community and an environment of civility and respect, and we ask that to keep, you, keep that in mind as we engage in this conversation. It gives me great honor to welcome Director Billy McMillan, subject Mario Ramirez Jr., Executive Director of the New York Latino Film Festival, Calixo Chinchilla, and our moderator and host of Latinos Out Loud, Rachel Strauss Munoz. Hello. Hello. You can continue clapping. It's nice. <laughs> this is my, my favorite size of crowd right here. Intimate. Yeah, this will be fun. Hi, how's everyone doing? Good? Great, what a great film, right? I, it took me a few minutes to get the knot out of my throat. I was like, please not go down, tears go back uh, so we could talk on this panel. Um, but what a, a wonderful, wonderful film to watch and enjoy now having watched it twice. Um, well, welcome gentlemen. Hi, three gentlemen and a lady up here. I like it. Um, I wanna get right into it and then there'll be a time for you guys to also ask questions. So start thinking about those questions soon. Um, Billy, what do you hope audiences take away from this film? Wow. Um, this, you know, this film came to me just, I, I was, I've worked as a documentary film editor for years and I, um, <clears throat> driving home on my west side commute, I, I live in Los Angeles and, you know, on my way home one day, I just uh, heard this tiny little radio news blurb about this this game, this game in East LA that where, you know, 25,000 people coming out to this game each year. And it struck me as, you know, I live 10 miles from there and I knew nothing about the community. And if I knew nothing about the community and I knew nothing about this game and it was this huge thing, it showed how you know, how we get in our silos in each one of our, in which each one of our community and yet our, our silos are, are overlapping in so many ways and, you know, our story is so universal. And so this was a community that I wanted, you know, the world to be able to see. I wanted the, I wanted um, middle America. I wanted them to see that the kids play football in East LA and, the, and, and they're as, you know, they're as normal as the kids that, that live in Texas. So, yeah. And the film has so many different messages, but if you can encapsulate some of those key messages from the film that go beyond the sport of football. Yeah, you... I mean, the, you know, the film really touches on inclusion. It touches on, you know, one of the, one of the storylines that came about as I was making the film was the story of, uh, of Stevie Williams, who is this kid who's actually, you know, he's kind of like the, the micro, you know, the, uh, the little immigration story within this community, and it's a, you know he struggles to kind of gain acceptance in the community within this this immigrant community, and so one of the big things was talking about inclusion, talking about tolerance, talking about you know one of the things that Mario talks a lot about is is family. You know this this community itself um, was for a long time um, kind of a transitory community. A lot of of waves of immigrants came through East LA, and now the Latino community really has made this their home, and they really wanted to like put down roots and make this their part of of, of America, and you know, and actually invest back in the community. So it's, yeah, I feel like I've said community too many times. So. Well, actually, I'm going to turn to Mario for a moment to talk a little bit about community. Um, we were talking offline just about the importance of just uh, what was conveyed in this film. So sort of the same question I asked Billy, what would you like audiences to take away from this film? Um, oh, what is it? Good afternoon, right? Or good evening? Um, He's still three hours behind. Yeah. He's on Cali time. It's okay, boo. It's whatever um, time you need it to be. It's your first time in New York. Yeah, it's my so first time in New York. So thank you guys for having me here. Um, it's pretty cold. Um, um, no, but yes, for the for the film, um, honestly, for me, like the main thing that 
throughout the whole time when we were recording it, I felt like the message that I wanted to make sure the people who viewed this film uh, got out of it was pretty much like how people who grew up in the community I grew up in and they're raised and they overcome obstacles or whatnot, um, they think about the unity in the community um, and they think about um, how like they really enforce family um, where I'm from. Um, so a lot of people, when they make the decisions they make, they make decisions for family. For example, there's a lot of people who stop going to school because um, they want to help get a job and help out their families. There's other people that go to school, like for example, myself, I'm currently still a full-time student and a full-time worker. So I got to pay bills and I help out with my family with rent and whatnot. So I do that just because like I said, it's family, so I gotta help out my family. Um, and by helping them out too, I still go to school because I know with a better education means I'll have a great, I, I, I have a great career to put me in that position, help them out even more. So I feel like family for me and for like all of my teammates and for even my rivals that I played against and yeah, only for the game, I didn't like them and after we're cool. Um, I kept in touch with, for example, like Stevie, I know he's in, um, I believe he was in... He's at Kansas. Kansas, there you go. He's in Kansas. I know he was balling out over there. Um, I got to talk to him. I actually got to see him a few weeks ago. I saw him in downtown. Um, downtown LA, he was in the ice skating range with one of his friends. So I want to go say hi to him. And he's doing well. And he said that he's about to graduate. And he said that he was hoping that he could still play like at least semi-pro football. I told him to keep doing whatever he wanted to do because I knew he, how much of a great athlete he was. So it's all about sport. Like for us, it's family. We're all family. Even though we're rivals or whatnot, it's family. And that's like the biggest thing that I wanted everybody to see coming out of this video. This film is like family is what keeps us going and family is what keeps us together as well. I really enjoyed watching the film just because of that element. It's the Latino way. It's just organic to our upbringing. And the camaraderie on the field, it, it, it didn't that make you feel special just watching those friendships? And now that you're telling us they're continuing, that's really, really wonderful. So speaking of representation and seeing all these beautiful Latino faces in that film, I'm gonna turn to Calixto for a moment. Calixto, could you sort of paint the picture for us and tell us a little bit about the Latino representation or underrepresentation of Latinos in films and maybe elaborate a little on the landscape? I mean, I think, you know, Billy and I were talking about this. It, it seems like with documentaries in particular, I, I think leading into the Trump era, uh, I think that there was um, a moment where Latinos, the, the Latino narrative was getting lost in the public media. And so we were talking about, you know, you had that, that whole season when he was running up, you had, you know, Black Lives Matter was like front and center, but at the same time, it's like, well, where do Latinos play in, in that narrative? Where do Afro-Latinos play in that narrative? Because we're part of it, right? Uh, being that the culture that we are. And then, you know, you saw what happened in Miami, you know, with, with the, 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 the killings there, you know, um, and then the Latinos, you know, we're fighting to say our names. And so we're, we're lost in that, that public narrative as well. And so it seemed like there was an urgency in the community that we had to tell our own stories to pick up the camera and document what we were seeing. And I think that, you know, Billy and I spoke about that. I think that was a little bit of, of something that he experienced as well. But that's even something that we've noticed in a lot of documentaries that have come from the festival, you know, including The Sentence, which talks about, you know, it's a, it's a film that we have played that, that talked about, uh, you know, uh, jail prison issues, but, you know, it's something that kind of Trump had mandated. Long story short, the filmmaker um, who, is the brother of the sister who's he's documenting literally like picked up the camera and was like, I'm going to tell my sister's story. But out of nowhere, he's like, oh, shoot, I made a film. That and was so Latino what you did, by the way. <laughs> His brother's sister's <laughs> god brother's mailman made a film. I mean, it's <laughs> and then went to his cousin's sister's aunt's birthday party and showed it. But it was about justice reform, right? And so you know, basically in that story, he was telling his sister's story because she was accused of a murder that she didn't commit. 
just because she was the girlfriend of the guy, her, you know, who killed the guy. Um, and literally, I think what you're seeing, even with the films at the festivals, yeah, that that urgency that we need to tell our stories. We can't leave it to somebody else to tell the narrative. And I think that's indicative of whether you're a documentarian or even, you know, making a general feature. I think that we have the tools and the technology to tell the story. You could tell a story in your iPhone. You could tell a story anywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's, that's, that's the landscape. The hopefulness of it all, and this is something uh, we had spoken about, is that, you know, now there's a streaming era, you know, and so you have all these streaming companies that are coming out, there's content money on the floor. But I think, I believe that there's an opportunity, you know, for the culture to be represented. You know, there's certainly, there's a hope, you know, that, okay, well, if, some, if Netflix doesn't pick us up, and HBO Max will pick us up. Or if HBO Max doesn't pick us up, maybe a Peacock or an Apple TV or something like that. But there's a little bit of hope where it's not just, just the theatrical and maybe TV and that's it. Now there's a little bit more of a window of opportunity. Now the trick is, is where do Latinos or people of color land in that, you know? And you're seeing some deals. I mean, there's, there's some stuff that, that's coming out every day about what these, uh, these streaming channels are picking up. But particularly for Latinos, okay, well, we still need a little bit more clarity of where our content lies. And, but, you know, so there's that. But there, there's certainly hope and we're certainly making more films but we need more it's, yeah yeah um it i really love what you said because i think a film like this does change the narrative a little bit it's empowering we do all have these um technological advancements that give us the tools to tell our stories yeah. and even for a person like me with the podcast uh it really gives me the platform to be who i am and voice the stories that make me a latina and it's funny because Latinos aren't listening. I mean, they're listening, but it goes beyond Latinos. And it really paints a wonderful picture as to why we're even here at the JCC tonight. Yeah. Diversity. Um, I want to turn the mic to Billy real quick, because uh, shooting so many Latinos and being in their homes and directing them, there had to have been a little bit of culture shock. Or what did you learn about our culture that you love? And did you see anything that you didn't love so much? That he liked partying with us. Um, in the part of the film, he, he went to go record a, a party. I, I wasn't there. I, I was sleeping. Yeah, I, I, I like how uninhibited they are. I think that's actually probably the thing about the community that I like the most. Um, they're, I mean, one of the things that, like, like Mario said, I, I, you know, I wanted to document this community 360, um, and they welcomed me in right away. Um, so it wasn't one of those things where I felt very long, like I had to kind of like, you know ingratiate myself into the community they felt it felt like you know instantly we were i was doing high fives with mario i was doing handshakes with them and you know and it, and it just it felt like a normal thing um i think that you know i i guess i i learned a lot about the community i don't i don't know if i can if i can boil it down to one thing um that would be you know kind of satisfying i you know the <laughs> It, it, it sounds stupid to say the food because that's, you know, you know yes. that's, 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 discuss, what. tell us, what did you have that you'd never had before? Well, I didn't have much myself because I've been a vegetarian for about 25 years. <laughs> that kills, so that what, I, what I had to do was, was, was politely eat around the things that I could eat. Yeah, that doesn't leave you much. Huh? Yeah, it doesn't leave you much in East LA. Yeah. Did you get any reception of that from your uh, family, Mario? Well, like, ¿Por qué no está comiendo este banquito? <laughs> No. Um, Why is this white boy not eating? No, for my my family, when he would come into like our house, he's like, "Why is he recording you?" I'm just like, "I don't know. It's a movie." And they'll be like, "But why?" They they mention it like this, but. Why is what is a white guy doing following you around? I'm just like I don't know. Do you want to know more about our like more about us and like about like our our culture and whatnot? She's like. Bueno, pues dile ahí, oh, she said, dile pues ahí frijoles y, y hay arroz y gusta con tortillas, con hechas a mano. So she makes handmade, like, tortillas uh, from scratch with her hand. They're so good. Like, I recommend you guys. Like, if you guys know someone who's Hispanic, they make you handmade tortillas. Bomb. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and she, 
and that's the thing with us, like with family, like with with where I'm from, like I said, we concentrate a lot on family and with our food, we're based on what I know from what I've experienced, we love to share food. That's the one thing we love to do. We share our food. Like if we see someone or you bring a friend, oh tell them to eat. And it's like it's disrespectful if you don't eat, you know, like so you have to eat. You can't say no to like abuelitas had me tortillas or whatnot. And that's the way we were with um, Billy when he came in. I feel like not only myself, but our my whole team, like the whole team, was like we we love Billy right off the bat. Like we loved him and we accepted him. Like we let him come into our locker, which is a pl place you have to, you know, it has to be earned for you to be going in there. But he earned it. We trusted him and like, all right, come here. So like, it was really cool that someone, you know, that from out of, you know, out of our like, out of our comfort, which is someone who was out of our area, like who isn't from our community, took interest in our like in our lifestyles and our in our eating habits or whatnot, and he liked it. And he he took the time and effort to like put it into this film, and you know we did our best to like show him like and sh give him the message of what we come from or, and what we're made out of. I have a question, and uh, you know, what was the level of trust you had to build? Because to your point, when you see somebody that's outside the culture yeah. that wants to tell a story, then you want to make sure that a it's not exploitive, and then what are you telling exactly? And so, how what was the level of trust that you had to earn um, in telling the story? Um, but also at the same time, um, you have to act like these cameras don't exist. You still have to live your life. Um, and you still have to piece yourself away from the subject and you can't get too emotionally attached to them. So what is that whole process like uh, from when you decide, okay, this is what I want to hit, this is a subject? I, I think them. for me, you know, because I've, I was a documentary film editor prior to this, I kind of had a rule going into each film that I made as, a, as an editor that I didn't want to meet the subjects beforehand. I wanted everything that came to me to be the, the stuff that's on the screen. So it was a real a difficult thing, you know, getting to know these guys. But for nine tenths of the film, until the big, you know, until that big day where we, you know, go to the to the big um, to the big game, it was literally, a, you know, the crew never got bigger than three, and most of the time it was just me by myself shooting with with the mic, you know, <clears throat> just me in the room, and and that's to that's to gain that level of in intimacy like one hundred percent. Um, I spent a couple of weeks just with the kids in the locker rooms. Just I would I would go in, not really even like interacting with them, just so that they could, just so I became another like piece of furniture in the room, um, and and not wanting to kind of engage them, not wanting to ask them questions until I had actually heard their voices for a few weeks, and and that's when I you know first started actually approaching kids and interviewing them and and you know getting into their lives was was once I had actually you know been there and started to you know melt into the background. And for you, like, how did you, how did you build trust amongst him? I mean, it's a two-way street in this thing. Well, honestly, when he first came up to me, he's like, when they asked me, I was just like, I asked, well, why me? You know, out of all people, why you guys want to follow me? And they're like, well, they're like, well, they just told me like, oh, they really, that the coaches had chose two people and I was one of them. So I was like, I mean, yeah, I was hesitant. I was like, well, like I got to know because I was confused, but I mean, after I was just, I don't know, I was just a kid. Like he said, he wasn't even there. He was just following me around. No, no. So he'll follow me and then, like, like for example, like when I will take the bus, he'll just, I'll get him through the front, he'll go in through the back, and he'll just be recording me. So it was like he wasn't there. And then after when he started talking to me and asking me, like, actual questions, I was just like, oh, this dude, like, really wants to know more about us, about me, about, like, about the way we live and whatnot. And I don't know, since I'm like the type of person who is like really open like to like meeting new people and whatnot. So like, I, he was cool. So like, I mean, he just became a really good friend. And yeah, pretty much all the character, uh, all the all the kids in the film, um, once they actually got the microphone on and sat down, they kind of unloaded. You know, it was like they had a lot kind of built up inside and wanted to say something. The kid Joseph, who you see, who's the the linebacker, who's you know, his name's Spike in the in the film. Mm -hmm. um, 
I tracked him around school for for a couple of weeks, and he would he would ditch classes and try to basically kind of dodge me for a couple of weeks, just because I think he was so nervous. Um, and this was after I had already been filming, you know, in his locker room, filming their practices for for you know about a month by that point. Um, and eventually, I you know I kind of cornered him outside of biology. I was like, "You're going to fail this biology class if you don't go." But would you, you know, would you sit down and, and, and talk to me afterwards? And he sat down and, and after that and told me his entire life story, like everything that had gone wrong in his life in like one, you know, hour and a half interview. And it was like the most like <laughs> cleansing moment for him right? and for me as well. It sounds therapeutic. Yeah. Billy, can you tell us a little bit about the budget for the film? <laughs> No one likes to talk about that. Rachel. I know nobody <laughs> likes to talk about it, but I like to talk about the things that nobody likes to talk about. So, uh, sorry. No, I mean, are there curious people here, especially some aspiring um, filmmakers and storytellers? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can tell you generally what the budget was supposed to be for the film and what it actually ended up being. We'd, we had budgeted to, to make this film for about $800,000. And we got, um, and my investor who came in to, to make the film gave me about half of that to make the film. Um, and we had to stretch that over about a four and a half year period. So um, it was, you know, this is a labor of love. You do not get rich making documentaries. Um, pretty much every penny goes into the production. Um, up until the big game, like I said, it was me and a couple of people that were that were making the film day to day. And once we got to the big game, you know, I wanted this film to look like I wanted their game, which they think or which they they you know treat as larger than life, like like the, you know it's the middle of it's the you know the biggest thing. It's the biggest night of the year for them. I wanted to treat it that way. So you know, we hired NFL Films cameramen to to come in and actually document a high school football game like it had never been documented before. And, you know, in order to kind of make this this you know grand cinematic moment in the film. Um, and, and so, literally, our entire budget, half of it was one day. So yeah, this is where I commend documentary filmmakers because really. Like, if you guys don't tell our story, who will? You know what I mean? And, you know, it's, it's the road to distribution is even harder for a documentary. You know what I mean? It, it has to break through or, or not. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're telling the stories that, A, you're not learning in school <laughs> half the time, but, but then you're telling, you know, these, these stories of the culture that need to be told, you know? And if anything, to go back to my point earlier, that's... What's the exciting point about this period is like Latinos are owning the narrative or we're taking control of our story and like, okay, if CNN is not going to tell the story right or somebody else, I can, you know what I mean? So. And what about the scoring, Billy? Because I, I really appreciate the music throughout the film and with an executive producer like Becky G, I'm wondering if she had anything to do with the musical component. So the, <clears throat> the actual scoring for the film, I mean, well, the, lo the last song is actually done by a, a, a band, a, a mariachi band here, a female mariachi band named Flor de Toloache. Um, and they're, they're actually a New York band. Um, and we reached out to them um, because, I mean, this is one of the, like, the, the joys of, of filmmaking is that for the longest time I had the end of this film done with um, Pink Houses by John Cougar Mellencamp. Um, and I was going to finish the film that way. You know, it's Ain't That America. It's a big protest anthem. I really, you know, wanted to do it. I wanted the film to end that way. Um, and he kept hedging and kept hedging and wouldn't let us actually have the rights to the to the uh, to that song. And so, in the matter of a weekend, as I was like finishing the edit, I you know, I found Fortunate Son, and I thought like this this speaks even more to the film, but. You know, I'm not going to do this with Creedence Clearwater re Revival. You know, it just had a the, completely the wrong yeah. sound. Um, and this is this had been a a band that I had started listening to as I was going through music, and so we reached out to them, and within a, within a weekend, they flew out to L.A. and recorded overnight this incredible version of Fortunate Son for the film sp specifically. It was like one of those like magical things where you're just like, how did I just make this happen by just, you know, 
in the, That's the, in the universe, yeah. boo. You know, it's the universe. Yeah, Becky G came onto the film um, later, and so we um, really to kind of to try to like get the film a, a larger Latino audience, and and really you know try to expose the film to as big of an audience as possible. And so that's really you know her her involvement. Um, the guy who who I used as a lot of um, I mean who kind of opened my door to a lot of Latino hip hop, which is a lot of the stuff that's in the film that, you've probably, that you're probably referencing, um, is, is one of my music supervisors, uh, Josh Norick. And he actually has a NPR show called uh, Latino Underground. Oh, yeah. yeah and, and, and so he, he's actually where we kind of like, he would open the door for a lot of those things and then I would just go looking through it. But every song kind of in the film is, is one that I've chose. It's wonderful. Well, now is the time that we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Anyone? Question? Haley, was that a hand I saw? I'm Anybody nervous to ask a question? Haley, think of a question. The mic's coming to you. Oh. Okay. Just kidding. Now we have a question from... Yeah, here you go. You're next, I think. Okay. Um, i just just wondering, did you follow a lot of players and then focus the film on those basically four or six players? Or, or did you pick those players from the very beginning? These were the four strongest um, players that I, that I chose um, at the beginning, but I, I chose about 10 players originally. And then, yeah, of course, you, I think with, with a lot of films that where you're, where you're doing a verite film, you're focusing on that, uh, you, you have to whittle the story down or else you can't spend enough time with the characters. So yeah, Mario's, you know, Mario's story was one that I was just drawn to right away. He was a kid that I was drawn to right away. He just was, he was, he was like a, a kid that was, you know, re, you could get close to right away and, and, and get a lot out of. And so, yeah. For, for Mario, have you noticed changes in the neighborhood in the last five or 10 years? For me, um, yeah, it's, they're like, it's been a lot of, it's, for me, I feel like it has been changing a lot. It's been, like I said, we're really open to like people coming in and then there's a lot of like, um, what is it? I believe it's, it's gentrifying. It's gentrifying. Yeah, yeah. it's gentrifying. So like, there's a lot of people, there's more, I see more like blacks. I see more, I see more whites and I see even Asians. I, I have four Asian friends now, like, that they, one of them lives, like, two blocks away from me. I'm just, like, I mean, I like that, you know, that, and then even um, on a new restaurant just opened up. It's a, um, um, what is it? It's a, it's a Filipino restaurant, and then that Filipino, um, like, food is really, really good. And I just like the fact that, you know, more people are coming into our community, and they're, like, they're all, like, I guess you could say they're making it. They're making our community like whole, you know, because it's a, it's filled with different types of ethnicities and um, even religious beliefs too. Like they're all different type of people, and we all respect each other, which is I for me, I think that's just beautiful. But yeah, and that's the big thing, the biggest change I've seen, and not only that too. Like they've been investing more money into our community, to, like to. Uh, keep it more cleaner, uh, cl cleaning like cleaning up the streets and the graffiti's on the wall. And you don't really see graffiti as much anymore, which is one of like the one things that I'm happy for the most because like the graffiti on the walls, like it really makes your community look like bad. And I'm, it's kind of good to see that there's not much graffiti in our in our neighborhoods no more. And they really enforce like on keeping it clean. And whenever they do see graffiti, people do report it immediately, so they take it down. So I think that's like one of the things that made me like see the change in my community. You know, things don't change that much. My parents both went to Roosevelt High School. Um, they were children of East European Jewish immigrants. Um, of course, my grandparents were not born in this country. Um, they both came from big families. And the way the two families became friends is my father and one of my mother's brothers became friends from sports. Um, so as I watch this, it's kind of like all the same two, gener two generations later. This is not... I, 
actually personally never went to Boyle Heights. I just knew that's where my father came from. And it was uh, growing up in Los Angeles. It was really, Boyle Heights is really another world um, because of the, the physical size of LA. You just don't go there. But I knew they went to Roosevelt High School. I yeah. Also, thanks for sharing. Boyle that Heights with is them. the is the Ellis Island of the West. You know, it's yeah. I'd love to know how we can find out more about the film too, and what everyone else's projects that's sitting up here before we close out. How else do we, how do we spread the word about the film? How do we spread the word about the New York Latino Film Festival podcast? You can spread word about the film. I mean, we we are in between streaming deals right now, so we're in the middle of negotiations for that. So. I wish I had a better answer on that one, but uh, the film will be coming to a, a few more uh, film festivals in the next month or two uh, before it kind of finishes its like official run. Um, you can find out more information about the film at allamericansfilm.com. It's, that's our website that has all of our screening information and everything on it. And, and yeah, I mean, the best thing is, is, is posting it on your social media, on your Instagrams, on, on anything if you, you know, hashtagging us, that gets us the, you know, that gets the outreach out there. Uh, for us, it's uh, nylatinofilmfestival.com. Uh, NY Latino Film Festival is also our IG. So, you know, please follow us there. There's a lot of activity on our Instagram, and you could kind of find out, you know, updates of not only what we do at the festival, but things that we do year round. So, follow us on Instagram if you guys do that thing. <laughs> Our website is wearelatinosoutloud.com, and the podcast is available wherever you can consume a podcast, Apple, Spotify, Pandora, iHeart. You can come over my apartment. We'll listen to it together. Um, I appreciate everyone here. Please subscribe to the podcast. That's how Apple knows we're alive and well. And leave us a review. We have over 130 episodes out there right now. We're entering our seventh season next Tuesday, and there are some live episodes episodes online as well. There's one that I highly suggest. I'm going to name drop, but we did a live show with Lin-Manuel Miranda at the Green Space uh, WNYC. That was our 100th episode, which is on YouTube. We've also interviewed people like Julian Castro, um, Maria Hinojosa. We are three sketch comedians and a conspiracy theorist, and we like to say that we move Latinos forward while making them laugh. So thank you for your support. Thank you to everyone here today on the panel, to the JCC for hosting this wonderful social justice film festival and all the other amazing events that you guys do. So, and a round of applause to everyone for coming out tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Isaac, Tess, Karima, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you guys. And um, you're going to get all the information about all the organizations that they represent.